Hi everyone, if you are an entrepreneur in the tech space, I'm sure you've had people talk to you about lean startup methodology. So what is lean startup? What does it mean to be a lean startup and how do you get started being lean? Well, Kate Rudder is going to be my guest today and we are going to talk about all things lean. I was really inspired by her startup weekend presentation and excited to share it with all of you as well. So stay tuned, you'll love it. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Jensen and I am COO and co-founder of TicketCake.com. We are one of the first companies to relocate to downtown Las Vegas to be part of a project called the Downtown Project, which is headed up by Zappos CEO, Tony Shea. We've been here for almost 18 months and we've loved being part of the Vegas tech community. Uh, this is the sixth episode of YFE Vegas Tech, and I will be streaming live the first and the third Wednesday of each month here from the Innovation Center, which is a co-working space that our team loves to work out of and would love for you to join co-working with us anytime you'd like. So be sure to reach out. We can get you a free co-working pass. So Young Female Entrepreneurs, for those who don't know, is an online platform that connects entrepreneurial women in their 20s and 30s with new people, brands, and headlines to help them start and grow their business. I met the uh, founder of Young Female Entrepreneurs, Jennifer Dono, at a conference in Seattle in March and instantly loved what she was doing. And so when she brought the idea to me to bring Young Female Entrepreneurs to the Vegas tech community, I was on board immediately. Now, my guest today is someone I really like getting to know and um, talking with about things, uh, all things lean. She is a visualizer, an entrepreneur, a designer who loves startups, sticky notes, and sketching. Her name's Kate Rudder, and she's co-founder of Luxor, and she gets to meet incredible entrepreneurs and help them design great customer experiences. Now, prior to Luxor, Kate was at Adaptive Path where she specialized in bringing customer empathy and collaborative UX principles to companies both big and small. You can find her on Twitter at Kate Rudder, and we're going to be talking a bit about her Startup Weekend presentation, and I've included that link um, in the chat room. So if you're in the chat room, check out the link to, to follow along with us. Kate is a strategist and designer with a talent for bringing startups and customers together through lean strategies, inventive design, and uh, participatory practices. So my first question for you, Kate, um, is about your Startup Weekend Las Vegas presentation that you gave last month. It was an awesome presentation. It made me really excited um, and I really wanted to share it with young female entrepreneurs. So for those of you who don't know, Startup Weekend is the 54-hour event where developers, designers, marketers, product managers, and startup enthusiasts come together to share ideas, they form teams, and they build a product literally in 54 hours, and, and they launch a company. Now, I have the slides from your Startup Weekend Las Vegas presentation, and it was one of my favorite presentations about Lean Startup. Um, so the first slide I want to talk about is the one that says, ask constantly, what is the smallest, simplest, fastest thing we can build to get this in the hands of people and move forward? What do you think about this, Kate? Tell us a bit about Lean Startup and tell us uh, what you think about Startup Weekend as an event for entrepreneurs. Sure. Well, first of all, it's awesome to be here. It's fantastic. Thank you for the invite. Uh, so the, the key idea about Lean Startup is that it's this new way, it's a new management approach for bringing inventive and disruptive products and services uh, to bear and to market in situations of extreme uncertainty. And I want to be clear about this idea of extreme uncertainty because for very stable types of businesses it might not be the right approach. But as we all know in the startup world, the situation of the market and how social dynamics are shifting is so um, alive and so unpredictable that we always find ourselves in situations of extreme uncertainty. And what happens is in a traditional kind of product making world, you know, you have, you define something, you design it, you develop it, you release it or deploy it. And it takes long enough for that sequential thing to happen that by the time you've actually released something, the, the expectations or knowledge you had that were based on how it was defined could have shifted and probably have shifted. So you end up launching a product that may not be something people want, um, they're not going to buy, you're not going to be able to run a sustaining business. 
So the Lean Startup um, idea is actually a, a collection of ideas, all of which have been going and maturing over time, but really putting them together into this different package that helps early stage companies and enterprises that are trying to reinvent really be able to validate and prove out their ideas at a much faster, simpler, less costly way to indicate and to kind of show that there is a, there's a sustainable business that they can actually build. So what I love about the Lean Startup methodology is it's, it's allowed very early stage companies to define and experiment and grow their businesses based on earlier customer adoption without a lot of overhead in you know, f high fidelity design or complicated code bases, et cetera. You could just put something out there at a much earlier stage. And that's where this, you know, that's the fastest, smallest, simplest thing you can build and get out there. The idea is it might not be any code at all. It might be a sketch that you can talk to people about and get their insights and understanding. And the Lean Startup products tend to be built much more with customers, almost as a co-creator, a co-developer of them. Uh, and that is why it's, a, it's just showing, showing to be a, a more valid way of building rapid and disruptive kind of a, a in, inventive products and services. And in that, in that light, Startup Weekend is a perfect kind of crucible for that kind of creation because you're so time, time jammed, you've only got these 54 hours, and you're there with a team, you not, might not even know what you're going to be working on. In fact, you don't know what you're going to be creating when you come in the door. And through this intense kind of involved experience, you have the opportunity to define and validate and experiment and put something out in the world um, at a much more rapid pace than you ever would have in a traditional product development or company evolution standpoint. So it's just, it's filled with energy and, and vigor and excitement and that challenge of get it out there, define something and put it out and see how it performs is really the mantra that the weekend needs. Very cool. So the, the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about and that stood out to me in, in the Startup Weekend Las Vegas presentation was your talk about teams and the slides that revolved around teamwork. Um, you've worked with countless startup teams, so you probably know quite a bit about team dynamics. Um, so I want to go over with the young female entrepreneurs who are watching the, the things that you identified that great teams do. So number one, they care about the problem. They know and they own how they work best. They're frank and candid because they respect each other. And fourth, they commit to the outcome. Um, so as part of being on a team in a 54-hour environment, I can see you know, how you can kind of identify these things quickly. But if you've been working on a startup for maybe six months or 12 months or 18 months or even longer than that, how do you um, approach the idea of are we a good team and build a better team? Great question. It's a great question. Uh, I believe that those four standards still hold true for as teams as they mature. There's actually a lot of team behavior that comes directly from the agile software development world about that the, the indicator of success for a team is being able to put out working code. So instead of having a lot of documentation or a lot of these things that are proxies for effectiveness, it's actually can we build something that works? And, and the idea of a lean team or a, or a healthy um, collective team in a startup environment is can we say the hard things? Can we look honesty and our biggest risks in the face at a very early stage where frankly it's emotionally exhausting and, and, uh, and grueling to do that? And can we hang together and reinforce each other's strengths, understand and, and work around each other's weaknesses because we've all got them? And how do you actually have those, keep those conversations and that team behavior at the forefront? I think where a lot of us have learned how to participate in group work has been either through school or through some kind of um, you know, career or large company. And those situations really almost always focus on skills, like what can you do? Mm. And not necessarily perspectives of how do you work and how do you do your best work. So as an example, uh, there was a team we worked with at Luxor during one of our design programs where the developer on the team was very focused on getting things done. He wanted to build code. That was his, that was the identity that he brought to that team. And when asked to kind of step back from that and do more exploratory work around the ideas and talking to customers and engaging people personally, that was really out of his comfort level. But the team together had committed to an outcome and he knew he needed to learn to participate in a different way so that he would have the best judgment to build the best code. So I think having those frank conversations and making it okay to have those honest conversations in a respectful way, but a really gut honest way, is, is crucial. And these teams, startup teams, all of us in startup world, you know, function under 
uh, high emotional anxiety. Sometimes we think, oh my God, we're going to change the world. Other times we wake up and we're like, oh, it's all going to crap. You know, it's just going to, none of this is going to work. It's going to fail. The emotional highs and lows are well documented. And having a team in that collective support system is crucial to get through that, this incredibly stressful and emotionally exposed time. So when you talk about the um, care about the problem, I think of the, the four different statements that you read out that, from my presentation, care about the problem, and then commit to the outcome are the two most important. So you really have to be in it to win it. You have to really care about it. It can't just be that you're a great designer, a great developer, and you want to express your skills because it's an interesting problem. You really have to be behind the performance of that product as value for a customer in the real world. Mm -hmm. And as long as you can kind of keep those two bookends really solid, and I mean explicitly reinforcing them, like have them up on the wall as a poster, like why are we doing this? It's so easy to forget. And so have those things that you can, physical artifacts you can rally around as a team and remember why you're there and force each other to to be honest with why you're there. It's so very easy to get distracted or off track of a startup because nothing's known. You're inventing the future. And being able to hold each other accountable for that is a tough human behavior, but it's incredibly important. And when you get it, it really sings. So that know and own how you work best and be frank and candid, candid with each other, kind of what I think of as like the middle squishy bit of the ice cream sandwich that the two outside belief systems kind of reinforce. Oh, that's great. That's great. So let's say someone's watching out there and they have an idea. Um, so what's the first thing that they do in the lean, lean startup process? Sure, great idea. There's a, there's a model. I kind of wish I'd, we'd drawn it out. But I've, I've seen entrepreneurs, there's kind of three flavors of entrepreneurs that come to an idea. One is they have an idea of a product they would like to deliver or potentially even a feature or some kind of product that they want to bring to the world. And that is, I think, the most common. Another type of, engineer, of entrepreneur um, talks about, like, I want to serve people like this. You actually see this a lot in the, in the family space where people are moms and they want to serve other moms. That's a pretty common one, especially for female entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so they're looking at a, a community of people for whom they, they believe that their product would be of service. And then the third type is one where you've seen a problem, experienced a problem that you think has significant um, impact and you want to solve that problem. So from these three different trajectories, they all require different entry points into entrepreneurship. And what's great about the Lean Startup is it recognizes that you can't just stay any one of those places. In order to really build a product or service, it's going to be effective, as we say, as we say at Luxor, a product that customers want, need, and love to buy, because they actually have to exchange some kind of um, currency for it, uh, you want to have all of those three learning modes they have acted on. So you want to, ha if you have a product idea and you could like draw out all the features and you want to get to the code, that's great, but don't go there. Don't invest in that code until you understand the problem that it could solve and the people that it would benefit. And then you have, for the first time, a coherent system you can start to experiment with. And if you understand the problem, then understand, then, then your learning path is to frame that problem in a way so that you can validate whether or not real people have that problem. And is that problem significant enough to dedicate your time and blood, sweat, and tears to solving? Is it valuable enough that people will pay for it? And then once you understand those two elements, you can start to envision or brainstorm the types of products that would satisfy that problem for those people. And then the last one with the, um, did I cover them all? Is, did I miss one? <laughs> is there a problem? Yeah, I think there was. With the problem, and you have the problem, then you need to understand like who has those problems. Um, or, or if you want to serve the people, you need to understand what those pe problems those people have. Really talk to them. And I mean face-to-face -face conversations. An hour is plenty of time to really start to understand um, what kinds of problems certain categories or, or customer segments have. And then from there, you can start to define the key problems that would be most valuable and then envision solutions. So there's no one entry point because there's three different inspiration points. But all of them at a very early stage, and I'm talking within a month or so, you should be able to have all of those three different components filled out in a paper form um, just on hand before you start building any code or experimenting with any service models or doing marketing materials or, or printing t-shirts or any of those things. All that comes later. In the lean world, you really need to understand the, the people, the problems they have, and the potential solutions that you would deliver. Yeah, and one of my um, favorite things that our team did um, through the Luxor activities um, 
was identifying our customer. So can you talk us through a bit of that? Um, Kate, you were there when, when we did the exercise. So we had Paul Potential, who's now evolved to Paul Polly Potential. Um, but it was a really specific person that Ticket Cake was trying to serve. Um, and the exercise was invaluable for us. So if someone now has their idea, um, they're now ready to go, how, how does it look to define who your customer is? What are some exercises you'd recommend? Sure, great question. Uh, the, the big, the big uh, I think, seductive promise is that you have a product that everyone will love and want. And that's just not going to be true, especially at the early stage. You really need to focus down on the smallest, most specific type of customer so that you can have a, a handful of people you can validate your ideas with. And how you do that, there's a very well-known practice in the user comes out of the user experience world about defining a persona. And a persona is a picture of a person. It's an aggregate person. It's not any one specific person that you would know. It's not you. It's not you know someone else that you've met. It's a consolidated picture of a um, aggregate person who describe who that's a description of your best customer, the person for whom your product. Um, would be best served and has the problems that you're trying to solve. So there's components to this persona and you can either elicit them through doing a ton of research and then distilling them down, but that's actually quite time consuming, very costly. Uh, so what we propose is following the lean startup idea, you capture your assumptions about who you think your customer is and then you put together conversations and you actually try and find these people, go out and talk to them and validate the things on your persona. So that was the activity we did together. And then what you find when you, when you are asked to identify, like, who is this person? What would their name be? What would be something they'd be saying about the problem they're having? And what are some demographics or facts? Where do they live? What's their family situation like? All of this helps you relate to your customer, not as the idea of an abstract customer, but as a real human being with real life and real needs. And then the most important elements to capture your assumptions about are what are their needs and goals? So what are they trying to accomplish um, within some realm of your products uh, or your, your business idea? And the last one is uh, what are their behaviors? What do they actually do that's observable that shows and indicates that they have a problem, the problem or the or are trying to solve the problem that uh, you would also be trying to solve? So these four categories, a picture of the person that's very clear, Factual demographics, so you can have a rich picture of a person, so you can close your eyes almost and, and envision them, and then having their needs and goals and their behaviors are the four elements. So that's a that's a quick hands-on activity that you can do with some very simple guidance. I think that's crucial. Um, it sometimes doesn't get you down to a small enough group. Our our goal is, you know, our natural behavior as humans is to be more vague and abstract. So getting really specific is an important skill set to to learn. And I think the one the person who's been doing great work on that is Brent Cooper, who's the author of The Lean Entrepreneur, and he talks about these micro segments. So he has an activity where you draw a square and you put your segment in it, and then you cut that square in half and think, well, what would part of that segment look like? So if, for example, Ticket Cake is event organizers. There's a a lot of flavors and shapes and forms of event organizers out there. Maybe it's event organizers just for public events. And maybe for the first types of experiments, you just want concerts because they have a tendency to have a lot of, of different venues. And maybe you just want concerts within the Vegas area. Even though geographically it's not going to be a product only for those people, it helps you hone in and really understand a small microcosm of that broader customer set. So as soon as you can get it down to where you think you can find and talk to about 10 to 15 people in that micro segment, that's where you can start actually having really good customer conversations and learning the actual real world problems that they're, that they're dealing with so you can validate the assumptions you have. So cool. That's so valuable. Um, I know it was really helpful for our team. Uh, so now let's jump into UX and UI and why those are different. Um, I know you have a lot of background with that, and I think it's really valuable for people who are new um, to a startup or new to being a tech entrepreneur. Um, so what's the difference, and how do you make your product rock at both of these things? Awesome. So thank you for that, because if there's one, if there's one like platform or soapbox I would like to get on, it's UX is not UI, actually. I have a couple talks titled that. And... The, the distinguishing factor is that UX is a broad mindset about delivering an experience kind of on the terms of someone else. So every product, everything that happens in time has a user experience. Whether or not it's a good one 
or an intentionally designed one is kind of the distinguishing factor. And as product makers and entrepreneurs, we owe it to our, our customers and our teams and ourselves to actually intentionally design a user experience that, that satisfies the needs and goals of the person who's having that experience. So user experience is a, a way of thinking about product um, and company building kind of in a, in a broader terms. Now UI is the interface that people directly engage with as they're using that product. So I like to think about this, there's a great metaphor online, which is if you think about uh, your product as breakfast, you might have the product components would be a bowl and all of the little Cheerios or the flakes set out and a cup of, of uh, milk and a spoon. And of all of that, the UI is only the spoon. It's that thing that's going to deliver that cereal to that person's mouth. But when you think about the UX, you think about a human being having breakfast, and it's a morning, and it's a, and you know she's having buttermilk just like grandma used to do, and the, the cereal's crunchy and it's rich and it's got raisins in it that are just like little pockets of bursting flavor. Like that is the that's the kind of language we use around UX. When we talk about UI, the spoon, we think, are the edges sharp? Is it going to cut someone's mouth? How do they hold it? What's the angle of the bowl? Those types of very specific types of, of interactions, if you will, and components of design that are much more, much more specific and much more, um, they're, they're much more, uh, I think, skills oriented. They're not about this entire experience. So when we talk about UX and UI as being the same thing or we elite them together and, and expect that, they, that the same techniques will get us both at the same time, we're just fooling ourselves because it actually is a different set of, specialist, of specialization skills to deliver a great UI. Um, but I believe every entrepreneur, every good thinking empathetic person has the skills they need to be an incredible UX designer. Hmm. That's great. Uh, so something that's uh, really cool that you do is communicating your vision with sketches and visuals. And um, I had scratched the surface a little bit on this. I saw you use stickies um, with the Luxor exercise that, that we uh, participated in with you, but I had no idea how um, deep this passion goes. So in Kate's bio, it talks about her being a sketcher and that um, she wouldn't be caught dead without a deck of sticky notes. Um, she's a master at communicating her vision with visuals, which is really cool. Um, and if you're ever at a startup conference or any kind of meeting or a panel with Kate, you're sure to find her sketching. So I included a few of these really cool sketches that you've done. Um, one was a Vegas tech panel that was done at South by Southwest B2B. Um, and it's so cool because you know, when you're when you're on a panel, I was on that panel, it's hard to even focus on what was said at the end of the panel. You kind of leave um, not even knowing what you guys talked about. But to look back at this and see Kate's notes in sketch form was really cool for me. Um, and a second one is a sketch that she did at another conference. And it goes into such elaborate detail and such beautiful colors and um, was really excited to have you share this with me, Kate. Um, so why do you love to sketch and why do you think that sketching in particular helps entrepreneurs and startups? Yeah, so obviously you've hit upon a, a deep passion. Even way back in my earlier part of my career, I think translating words into some kind of visual format has, has just dramatically changed the, the act of listening that I was able to bring to a situation. And that has been a practice that I've done in consulting work as well. It's pretty amazing when someone is writing words up on a, on a board, you know, you have this kind of intellectual relationship to it. But when someone draws a picture, it activates a different part of our brain, a much older part of our brain that deals with spatial reasoning and kind of emotion and some people call it the lizard brain. And really that visual, uh, that visual relationship to information has a quality that I call get itness. And you, know, you can go through the tropes of a picture says a thousand words or whatever, but it's really true that when you describe, if you were to describe in words on a sheet of paper a tree, you could write a lot of words and not actually have someone be able to visualize, close their eyes and visualize what that means. But if you just draw you know, a shape, kind of a fluffy shape with some lines through it, someone will say, that's a tree. So the ability to grow up complex information faster is just incredibly heightened. So many of our startups nowadays are dealing with abstract concepts that are very tricky to try and communicate, especially in language and words and narrative form. And having a visual capability, even some very simple visual skills where you can sketch and draw, 
just enhances team connection, enhances communication of information just dramatically. So I think it helps with rapid communication. It really helps with active listening when you're listening to someone. Many people actually speak in pictures, um, and, and capturing that helps you remember it. It helps with recall, both for a t as a team as well as individually. And it also increasingly is being used as a way to um, simplify denser written forms like books and things so that people can make an informed choice whether they want to go in and read the whole book or watch the whole video. So it's all about spreading these messages in a much more delightful, interesting, intriguing, more human form. And there's a guy, Dan Rome, who wrote a great book called The Back of the Napkin, which is about visual practice for problem solving specifically in business. And he has this phrase that he uses. He says, the more human the picture, the more human the response. And as, startup, as entrepreneurs, I think we all want a human response to the businesses that we're building and with our customers. And so being able to, to deliver in some kind of rough or loose sketch form the core concepts of your business, how the business model works, um, a picture of your customer, uh, some ideas that you're having and structure, structure them visually just really enhances you know, the human connection with our companies. And I think that's delightful and important. So cool. Well, I wanted to tell you what's happening on Twitter. So we have Melissa Penton from Toronto, and she says um, that you provided a great distinction between UX and UI, and UX is a clear story. Um, I think she really liked that, that slide from your presentation, and I loved this presentation, everyone. So um, I think the mark of a good presentation is if you're taking photos with your phone of every slide as it comes up. And that's what was happening during Kate's presentation for me. So you can find Kate's presentation on slideshare.net by searching her name, Kate Rudder. Um, and it's a really great presentation. She has a bunch of other good ones in there as well. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Kate. Uh, really appreciated having you. Well, what a pleasure. And I just want to say to all of the, the participants out there, like, go make awesome, amazing businesses because it is a, it's a way of life that's important for our communities and our families and our, and our country, and it's just awesome. So, and the world. So, that. go do it. <laughs> I second that. So our next episode is on Wednesday, October 2nd. We'll be here at the Innovation Center. I'll be streaming live at 4 p.m. Pacific. My guest um, is going to be really exciting. Her name is Lisa Shufro, um, and she's actually helping Las Vegas become one of America's healthiest cities, which is great for me because I live here. Um, she will be living here now in Las Vegas, and she her sole purpose is literally to redefine healthcare. Uh, she's the former managing editor of TED Med, and she, curate, she cur curated the innovators um, who were changing the future of health and produced TED Med each year. So she has a wealth of knowledge. We're going to be talking about healthcare and startups and wellness, and it's going to be a great time. So hope to see you guys on October 2nd. And uh, thanks again to Kate, and I'll see you guys all in the chat room after the episode. Thanks. Thanks.